So yeah, I'm Ezi Chidiofong, um, and I am absolutely thrilled to bits um, to be on this panel today. Um, I think as an African, we're all inherently aware of the potential and um, amazing creativity um, on our continent. Um, but what's really exciting at the moment is that sort of sense of momentum um, and also the sort of the really intensified global interest that we, we're seeing at the moment. So we have assembled a delightful panel of um, giants of industry <laughs> and uh, members who kind of represent sort of every element and every stage of, of that chain at the moment. So can we start off by just getting, let's just go down the line and just quickly introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your business. Um, I'm Reni Falawiyo. I'm the founder of Alara, um, a contemporary African lifestyle project um, uh, about fashion, design, uh, uh, celebrates fashion, design, art, and food. And um, we um, aim to um, put African fashion and design on the map um, in a way that um, doesn't make it inferior, that sort of celebrates and um, put it on, in context with the best designers and best um, best um, brands in the world. Um, and yeah, so we have a flagship store um, which sells fashion, sells art, sells design, but also is um, sort of um, um, an iconic space for exchange of ideas and education about uh, the future of Africa. Yvonne? Um, I'm Yvonne Fasimro. Uh, a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I set up Adara Foundation in 2016. What drove me to set it up was really just the understanding that in as much as our continent has incredible opportunities and also uh, massive challenges, it's our duty as Africans, certainly mine, to start to do something, anything, to start to um, make sure that those opportunities are actualized. For me, I chose to work focusing primarily on women's empowerment. Um, I also, at the back of that, focus on things that promote our culture and our traditions and take them, and basically in anything that we do and anything that we stand for, we're thinking world-class global standards. And the other, thing, the other two important areas that we focus on are promoting our arts, particularly the documentation and exposition of our arts and culture. And last but not least, perhaps the most important is the ed edification of our people. And they all tie together in some way or the other. But we spend about 80% of the time for, uh, of the resources and uh, time of the foundation on women's empowerment. We look at it from a complete, uh, from a, a slightly different perspective. We wanna go beyond thinking about the, the typical dialogue around capital, providing capital and um, human capital, financial and human capital, and really looking more broadly at the ecosystem that must be in place to empower women. So at this stage in the journey of Adara Foundation, we're taking tiny steps. One of our initiatives, um, which is a, a teaching women how to make a direct high and die, um, is the first step is to, to equip the women with the skill. In addition, we must teach them how to make businesses, scalable, sustainable businesses in their space, and then their relationship with money and how they grow, not just their businesses, but their ecosystems around them. And fight, last but not least, the health structure that they have in place. Within all of that, thinking about the psychology of a woman, and what we need to do to encourage her to succeed is critical to our success. We want to do these, so we started off with Adara, we have our access to market program, we have financial inclusion programs, we have also um, market outreaches. We want to do these really by making sure that these women become very active, highly relevant ac uh, actors and contributors to the socio-economic development of our continent by being in key sectors like fashion, like retail, like en energy, uh, manufacturing, et cetera. So this is really the start of something I think very exciting. Uh, and so far we have almost 10,000 beneficiaries to date. Thank you, Yvonne. Jacqueline? Good morning, everyone. Um, 
yeah, first of all, it's lovely to be here amongst and be called a giant amongst other giants here because I think it's, we're all doing fantastic work in industry. The work that I do with African Fashion Guide is promoting and supporting the full supply chain. So it's focused on the manufacturing from the field to from cotton to the cloth um, through to the retail. So it's just supporting brands and retailers who want to up level their sourcing in Africa to be able to connect with the continent, produce their own manufacture textiles and garment manufacturing, bags, shoes, etc. So the whole supply chain. So do that in different platforms. It would be through the business academy, it would be through the sourcing trips, so taking groups to the continent, to specific countries, to meet with suppliers and meet with ministers and, and trade specialists so they can set up their business on the continent. As well as that, we do conferences every year to spread the word and raise um, awareness that Africa does or is a sourcing platform. It is a sourcing region of the world and to change perceptions overall. So that's in a nutshell what I do. And um, David, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm David. <laughs> I'm David Suddens. I'm the chief executive of Flisco, which is 173 years old this year. First sold fabric into Africa in 1875. We employ 600 people in the Netherlands and 1,600 across sub-Saharan Africa, mostly in Ghana and Ivory Coast, but also Benin, Togo, and uh, Nigeria and DRC. Um, Frisco is not the big giant that everybody tends to assume that it is. We're a medium-sized company turning over about 250 million euros. Um, most of the fabric, more than 90% of Flisco fabric that you find in sub-Saharan Africa is counterfeited, copied, and smuggled over the border, and it's not authentic Flisco. Um, so I think the, the argument that a lot of sort of multinational companies make about when it comes to uh, doing business in Africa is that it's a really arduous um, process. Um, there are numerous challenges involved, um, you know, from infrastructure to, they claim that to, to be a lack of sort of a sizable market. Uh, it'd be really great to get your thoughts on, 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 on that topic. Um, Rennie, you look like you want to jump in on that. <laughs> um, interesting. I, I do agree that um, um, there's um, sort, of a, sort of a lack of infrastructure for a lot of areas that um, we could have infrastructure for. But I'm, I, I look at it from a p completely different point of view. And since we're talking about fashion, I'll talk about fashion. I think we misunderstand the stage that we are in in the development of the fashion sector. And because of that misunderstanding, we see everything as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and um, from my point of view, and from being in the position that I am, I see uh, potential, and I see the need for structure. And we're able to sort of influence what that looks like. So in terms of what the designer does, um, how it gets the, to, to the market, um, it's developing fashion schools, it's you know, finding a way to include apprenticeships, things like that. That's what needs to be done, making them understand what business is, and then going on to production, and to make sure that you influence government in a way that they can assist in that way. So from that point of view, I think it's work in progress. There's a, there's a certain amount of to, well, uh, patience, I suppose, that's required, really, to really understand that that, that growth will need time to happen. Yes, understanding and being in the business. Yeah. I think it's, it's important for, for us as retailers and for supporters of young designers, mm -hmm. it's important for us to understand what it takes to get them from zero to 100. Also, for, for so the more, more sort of established international designers, we act as a window to sort of, to, 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 for them to see what the potential could be um, um, in terms of establishing businesses in Nigeria and making, making and taking advantage of the fact that we have a big luxury market um, um, in Nigeria. So um, I think that um, <clears throat> we just need time. I think that all the issues, for instance, we want to set up a shop, you know, you, you have to have permits, you have the taxes and all that. I think we're in a position to influence the way that grows mm -hmm. because the, um, retail in, 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 in Nigeria in particular is so young, formal retail is so young that um, we are one of the first to come in on that level and want to make what has been informal quite formal. Mm -hmm. And I think that in doing it, we've been able to understand where the market is and see what we have to do and what we can advise people to do, both people who are wanting to, 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 to invest and, and also the government 
um, um, to understand what they need to do to create a better environment for the development of fashion in, uh, retail in Nigeria. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, David, your company is, is, is doing uh, business sort of in a pan-African way. Can you, is there anything you want to, to add to that? Um, difficulties in Africa, yes, we all know what they are. First of all, there's inconsistent economic policy, both macroeconomic and microeconomic. There's problems of devaluation um, across the, the region. There's lack of infrastructure. I mean, it does vary from country to country, right? So it's obviously so. I mean, in Nigeria, for example, the Economist likes to write that Edinburgh City in Scotland generates more electricity than the whole of Nigeria. Um, so that is a really big deal when you're trying to attract investment into Nigeria. Um, there is bureaucracy and there is corruption, which varies also from country to country. So he, I, I'm, I'm going to start by acknowledging some of the, the issues, only because it helps us focus our mind mm -hmm. on the solutions. So the minimal investment in quality, the level of innovation, um, the taxes, taxes in inverted commas that businesses face, particularly in businesses where margins are not necessarily inf infinite and certainly can be, can be affected by some of the macro conditions that we just mentioned. Um, innovation and technology as well are things that make it difficult to deal in our continent today. But let me talk about the market that we have. Yeah. I like data and I, f I'm, I obsess about getting information in. So some of the reports say that the African prince market is a market that's about a $1.5 billion market today. Problem is 80% of that market is informal. So it's hard to manage it and move it. And then when you move to the apparels, this is across the continent, it's about a $5 billion market. And that's in, in a market that we have to admit is relatively inefficient. So I want us to stop back and, and think about the, the opportunities and realize how quickly things can change. So if we look at things like um, how long it's taken for Facebook, Netflix, and Instagram to be relevant and to be driving the, the economies, it gives us uh, driving how we all live our lives. It gives us a sense of how quickly things can change and gives and should give all of us a sense of determination about acknowledging those challenges and insisting every day to find solutions to fix them, particularly around innovation and technology and also some of the infrastructure um, things working with our governments to create the right operating environments for manufacturing in Nigeria to succeed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is, this is something that will happen. It's a question of when, and it's a question of how much we put into it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Jacqueline, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, totally agree with everyone's um, um, comments on that. Um, we're here talking about the business of African fashion, and African fashion is an industry, well, fashion, sorry, um, is an industry. I've worked in fashion for nearly 20 years now, and um, it's an industry where it's the most complicated, one of the most complicated industries out there. You've got a, a manufacturing industry of finished products, but it's very much aligned to agriculture. If we think about it, you know, if we're looking at cotton, we're looking at um, cellulosic um, textiles as well, so those are basically coming from trees. Um, and cotton, like you may see up here, this um, campaign I did for about 100% African um, cotton teas. I did this campaign and brought it to the catwalks of London Fashion Week, Ghana, and in Los Angeles, because 95% of co African cotton was, ex was exported. It may be around 97. I don't know if you got the most latest figures because you guys do a lot with the cotton, but majority of it is exported, which means a lot of the value is lost. This is infrastructure issues. Okay, if this there's more of a processing of the raw materials and that on the continent and it's kept in the continent, it means that at least there's value kept on the ground and that means that at least there's more money coming in. It's all about more trade with Africa over aid for Africa. That's what I believe. So I think, you know, what's also really exciting is, is really understanding the incredible craftsmanship, creativity, skill, entrepreneurship that, that exists um, across the continent. And it'd be really great to, to touch on, on the elements of of, of, of craftsmanship and, and creativity and, and how your businesses all kind of harness that. Who wants to go first? 
Yes. Um, we are not really a craft-based business, right? Uh, we are an industrial business, and um, I see you know, craft-based businesses at one end of the spectrum and mass manufacturing at the other end, which we need, of course, to convert this cotton into, into yarn and into fabric and then dry and print it you know, locally. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, I mean, that, this, this is a huge thing. It's yeah. a huge part it's, of what, it's what, massive. what you do. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I'm, I'm a banker, right? So I kind of thought, let's promote Adirai tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised and increasingly excited by the extent to which, just even in that small space of fabric design, the, the, the amount of our culture and the creativity within it is mind-blowing. Let me, let me share this with you. So we take women who, and so our, our training is targeted to low-income women. Mm. And we look for women who, on purpose, so part, part of the ethos of the training that we give in Adara Foundation is to, ex to acknowledge the fact that there is no formal education in place. And, and actually explore that opportunity to train smart people and people who have the work ethic to work to do anything. So to be conservative, less than 5% of the women who come in and design the fabrics that you will see from Adara Foundation have ever done design. Mm. These are just women who want a better life, who want to work for that better life, and who come into an enabling environment that has the right standards, the right culture, that you should, you should see my facilitators talk about drawing the creativity out of women. If they're upset, if there are things that are bothering them, translating that into fabric design. And you can see some of the things that these women create, but they're not experts. Mm. I'm not an expert. But it's, so we have our history and our tradition, but more than that, we have what is possible from our people. And that's part of what keeps me very excited about this particular part of our culture. And I think... I mean, you work, you work with this area in a really sort of interesting and kind of, uh, sort of a, way, a catalyst almost. Uh, do you want to give us some more detail on that? I mean, I think it's a very, very exciting area. And uh, we surprise ourselves all the time with the amount of um, what that could be for a resource for designers and a resource for us and what we do um, in terms of educating and exchanging ideas, but also equipping designers with... Um, with um, the idea that they can do so much with what they do by being influenced with, um, um, with the culture and also with the people who can create all sorts of things. Yes, that is, that is a fact. So as a resource, I think it's very interesting and I think that um, it fits very well into this idea of sustainability and how important that will be going forward for everyone in the world, not just for Africans or Nigerians. Um, more importantly, yes, I think that the, inf the, the kind of, um, if you look at the way India has been kind of a, a resource and a feeder for a lot of, um, um, of, of design in the world uh, and, and so far, you know what the possibilities can be with, with Africans, both for Africans and for the rest of the world. So in that sense, it's super important. It's super important what Yvonne is doing in terms of empowerment and how that will help for, 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 for people in the rural areas and, and how it will help the development. But I think also important on the other spectrum is to understand the limitations of that. And I think that um, the limitations in terms of the growth of, of, of the people themselves and the, the, the journey out of poverty, I think it's also important that we look at the other side, which is that what are we doing in terms of production and manufacturing? Because in terms of real numbers and getting people real jobs um, and getting them to, to, to move from the rural areas to kind of a more urban lifestyle, it's going to be about manufacturing and production. So we, we understand that, and I think that both of them ha have to work hand in hand, mm -hmm. and that we can be sentimental about what this can do. It's meaningful, and will always be meaningful, um, and I think it helps us to preserve our culture, and that is important. But I think in terms of real empowerment, I think we have to also think about how we balance that out with important in investment in infrastructure that will help real production and help real lives to move forward. I just add to that one, I think. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, um, I just wanted to add to that because um, it is about, you know, the impact that it's making, like I was saying, because 
um, the craft industry, we're talking about the crafts and everything, that's what, you know, it's one of the, the second biggest employers um, in developing, in the developing world, developing countries. I hate the phrase, but that's how many African countries are classed as um, developing countries. So it's the second biggest employer. So it's for a continent that's growing crazy growth um, when it comes to population, those who are entering the job market, remember Africa as a whole is a generally a young continent in regards to people's age. There's a lot of people coming into the job market every year, a huge amount, and they're needing jobs. So it's an opportunity that something like this industry can provide, um, provide work. Um, so it is a part solution, though it's not the solution. I think that's really well said, and I think, I mean, speaking of investment and, and manufacturing, uh, you know, David, you're sort of, this is something that you guys are actually really looking into quite intensely. Do you want to talk to us a bit about the investment you're trying to make at the moment? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure, I will. Well, first of all, we're investing 20 million um, euros into our factory in Abidjan to increase capacity, to improve quality, to move to more sustainable energy. We've got an installed biomass energy uh, facility. Um, there and we've also got, I think, some of the first digital printing in in sub-Saharan Africa, which is in Abidjan. So we're investing there. Not so much in Ghana. Ghana was inefficient, so we've cut that back a little bit. Uh, but yes, I'm trying to uh, attract foreign direct investment into Nigeria. I've got partners who have agreed to build a 400 hectare textile park in Nigeria. Um, these uh, and I've got spinners and weavers. Uh, from China and Pakistan who are prepared to come to Nigeria on the grounds that Frisco will lead the way and Frisco will guarantee to buy the output. So this is a, a, a vision that would go from using Nigerian cotton, the staple length of which needs to be increased because it's not long enough, uh, the yield is not good enough, it's about a quarter of what the yield in India is, for example, just under 500 kilos a hectare. Um, we would then spin, we would weave, we would print in Nigeria, not wax printing, it's too expensive. We would, we would print digitally. We would want to set up garment manufacturing. It's not our business, but we've got American partners who think there's a big and important market in America for fabric that is African, African-designed, African-manufactured. And there's a big market for, for Afro-American uh, women uh, in the States, uh, in retailers like Walmart and Target. We would open uh, probably 50 stores in Nigeria if we could. We have a couple now. Uh, we would open some more once we were manufacturing there. And we are also currently um, starting a venture. We have started a venture, which my colleague Gabriella runs, uh, called Frisco & Co., which is an attempt to engage with young, experimental, creative people. We've got a network of over 50 um, creative people across sub-Saharan Africa. And we talk to them and we try to learn from them how they see the culture yeah. in Africa and how they see their future and how they see the role of print, if at all, in their culture. So those are some of the things that we're doing, but it is mostly about trying to create employment. Um, I could talk to you at great lengths, so I'll stop, about the transition of the textile industry um, around the world. I mean, I've, I've actually done it. I mean, I, you don't remember when Singapore and Japan's industry was based on textiles. I do, because I did it. Um, and I'm sure that it will leave China, and I'm sure it will come to Africa. But, but as, as, as the textile industry develops, always in search of lower uh, labor costs, yes, it's becoming more and more automated, more and more capital intensive. You don't create much employment now with actual textiles. You still do with garment manufacturing, but if we're not careful, that will also be taken over by artificial intelligence. I mean, at the moment, it's very difficult for robots to get the feel that the human hand has for slippery fabric between the fingers. But somebody just recently has invented a glove um, to, to, to monitor all of the sensors in the human hand and then to transmit that you know, to artificial intelligence. So that also, I think, will eventually take over clothing. But anyway, that's another well, subject. Well, I think so, well, I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, and then I think that that might help Africa leapfrog in the mm -hmm. sort of manufacturing Af area. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I, I'm not sure how that will affect sort of um, jobs, and I, I haven't really researched that. But I see that happening, that we kind of will, will sort of leapfrogging into the, the robot age, and then we'll have to reassess how that sort of 
is of advantage or advantage to us. Do you see us um, leapfrogging before we even get to like the initial stage? <laughs> well, I see the world leapfrogging, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that we'll be left behind because yeah. I imagine that it'll be more efficient mm -hmm. and easier to set up, um, even expensive. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I, I agree, I, I, and I think we need to rely on that for the growth of the economy. I do think, though, that that means that we have to work and you're the champion of this, we have to work very hard to promote the luxury end of the craftsmanship of what we do. Because at some point, we need to make some of those things irreplaceable. And that's what's going to keep human beings doing some of these things. So where we can still make them efficient and automate them and uh, leverage it, it's fine. But we have a hundred and, depend on whose numbers you look at, 190 million people in Nigeria alone, or 120, 140, let's not debate the numbers, who do need to be fed, yeah. and who do need to have uh, economic development and, and all the opportunities that they, that they deserve. So, so we need to really nurture we, so, that yeah, sort of so we need to, so it, And it, I think it's our jobs as Africans yeah. to embrace technology and understand what it means, as it's, and with that, things like data, artificial intelligence, so that we can, frankly, manipulate it to work for our people so that we still leverage it, it's still useful and productive, and our people are advancing. How, though? We have to think it through. And, and it's part hard. of it is, it's, it is hard, and it's about, and this is where, Thinking about how we equip our people with skills is something that I'm, again, very preoccupied with. And the adaptability of changing your, your skill set is also very important. But it's a big preoccupation, but we can't just take artificial intelligence and take technology as is without um, trying to see how we can adapt it to. I mean, it does bring the question of global competitiveness I understand that, but you, we have to look at what that really means. Being commercially global, globally competitive, but not socially globally competitive, is something that we, we should all be thinking about as well. Yeah. It's a big, it's a yeah, big, it's thing. A big issue all over today. the world, and I think yeah. that we will, we will evolve um, and see how it goes, but it's kind of this major problem all over, yeah. and we don't know what's going to happen. But it's also not, it's not one size fits all, right? No. So, I mean, for instance, Yvonne, it would be really great to get a sense um, Sorry, Jacqueline, get, get a sense from you as to how you go about selecting the countries that, that you're really sort of, you know, focusing on in your business as well. Um, okay, yeah, I'll explain that. But first, um, what you were saying around um, luxury, the importance of that, because what I also see is there's lots of retailers who are looking at the African continent as a source and region now. They're starting to see others do it and they want to do it. I could, I could spill off a whole load of names or companies. Do. Already, I mean, you've got, of course, the big one most people probably know is H&M. Um, you've got Tesco's, you've got uh, Gap, the PVH group, you've got Calcedonia, who do like a lot of swimwear and kind of beach products, who are, you know, set up, even Topshop has produced. Many countries, many um, companies, sorry, have already produced and are producing in Africa. You know, there are, um, oh, nice. are large-scale production in particular countries. So when I'm looking at, um, when I'm looking at which countries that I will rec recommend or places to recommend to brands retailers, for example, it depends, first of all, what is their MOQ, the minimum order quantity. They've got huge minimums. They've got, you know, they're going to be doing big orders and they're going to be looking for production, which may be in countries like Mauritius or in Morocco or... Madagascar, you know, now Ethiopia, which is a hot topic country of Ethiopia, um, business parks have been opening up like crazy because it's a huge country as well. So, you know, you're looking at that, whereas if it's a smaller designer, maybe the ones who want to do luxury, you want to be using like the Kente or the Ashoke or the, the Shamo, different types of cloths or text, te textile techniques, then I'll be recommending smaller producers and artisans in various countries in west and east or south, wherever it may be, or even north. But um, yeah, it really depends. Um, so when I do my trips, I'm looking at, when I do trips to Africa and I take people, at the moment I focused on Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, disqualifying the other countries. First of all, it's a lot of work. And secondly, um, there needs to be things, you have to look at the whole thing. You need to look at risk, you need to look at infrastructure, you need to look at 
government, you know, what they're focused, are they focused on the manufacturing industry? Is it going to be an enabling environment for, you know, brands and retailers to be able to set up? There's a lot of factors, regardless if it's in Africa or anywhere else in the production regions of the world. So I focus on those countries because of, of what they have at the moment that's available. But there are others I'm looking at and do have factories all over the continent that I work with. But for the trips, they're mostly in those three countries right now. Sorry, may I make a comment about luxury? Yeah. I think it's very interesting what you said about the craft-based luxury. I think the history of luxury um, would reinforce that. Uh, luxury, luxury business is a European business. Uh, has been European business and has been based on craft. And I think there's nothing wrong with luxury insofar as luxury brands create trends um, and, and they give people something to dream about and something to aspire to. So I, I think that that is a, a very good thing. And we've seen what happened to the luxury market in Asia, for example, as uh, the middle class grows and disposable income grows. And the, 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 those brands who've been focused on retail and, 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 and a presence in Asia have done the, the best. So far, um, I think luxury in Africa is something that you're obviously better placed to talk about than me. I think it's really, really sensitive. I, I am sensitive about it, and, and we are. I mean, Fisco is at, Fisco itself, not that, not our sister brands, is at the top of the market from a price point of view. We can't do much about that. Um, but there's such disparity of income uh, between the richest and the poorest. Um, I was reading a statistic the other day which said of 157 countries that have been measured for attempts to reduce the disparity between the richest and the poorest, Nigeria is the last on the list, it's the 157th. And by 2030, it is reckoned that a quarter of poor people in the world, that is um, be, be, uh, earning less than $1.90 a day, that a quarter of them will be in Nigeria in a decade's time. So, I think before we get too carried away on luxury, and as I said, of course there's a place for luxury, and Fliska has, is part of that place, I think we should address the fundamental economic issues. Don't just talk too much about leapfrogging, let's address the issues, let's create employment, and let's try to raise everybody's living standards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for Can that. Um, yeah, I think it's an, an important point. And I think the very um, um, essence of luxury is to create beautiful things by, by people using their hands or sort of um, creating beautiful things with people who can do it. Um, and usually they are poorer, right? But the point is, for Africa, I think the kind of luxury that we want to encourage is that which benefits the maker as well as benefits the person who uses it. Tra traditionally, Traditionally, luxury itself could be exploitative. We, we, pro we, we position ourselves in a way that we are putting African luxury on a pedestal so that people are not exploited and that we are encouraging people to pay good money for their work. Absolutely. And we will continue to do that and it is possible to do that. It's possible to do that because you change the mindset of people. You create products that are quite global in its look, but has the essence of the handmade crafted objects. And you put it alongside all the best designs in the world, and you sell it. That's actually the point. You sell it, and you sell it for good money. Now, I, and, I, and I know that it's hard to understand. We have said on a very small level, on a small level, but we see the, a huge difference when you decide that you need people to understand what you're doing and to pay, pay their money for it. Yeah. For them to say, you are patronizing. You, you want to, you want, your, your patronage is important to the person who has made this. So for instance, I'm wearing a jacket that's based on traditional Nigerian weaving. And this has been like vintage fabrics. We, the designer put women together from Senegal, from Burkina Faso, and had this amazing exchange where she created these objects that have history. They have, um, they're important in terms of what they're doing for the women. And we put, it in a, uh, we put it on a level that people had to pay a lot because we're going, to, we're going to pay it by giving them objects of beauty to live with. And I think that's the way it has to go. Yeah. I, I, I just couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the reason why I've set up Adara as an NGO is that the women get paid 
per fabric that they design. They're not paid as employees, they're paid as participants in, in the economy. Um, I hear you about Nigeria being 157 in that list, and I hear you about um, the market not necessarily being that tangible, but I'm focused on us producing luxury goods that can be sold anywhere in the world. My market isn't just Africa. What is clear, though, is that the, the fabric, and we collaborate, it's a huge part of what we do, is collaborating inside Nigeria and outside of it. Right now, I don't even have the infrastructure to cope with the interest that we have in the beautiful fabrics and garments that are being produced. I just don't have the infrastructure. And I'm not talking, uh, I'm talking hundreds, thousands of pieces that people are asking us for now. By God, we will set it up. And that's the difference with Africans being part of this dialogue and being part of this exchange, to understand the challenges that we're discussing here, but be that more determined to do something about it. It's really about reframing, reframing the narrative um, and actually sort of really being part of that conversation. Um, and I, I hate this word, but normalizing our craftsmanship and luxury within that that sort of area of the business. You know, for obviously for a very long time, there's been, you kind of, you, you, you get all of this really beautiful, uh, you know, such skillfully created, created pieces, but I don't think actually we really spoke about the inherent luxury in it. It's sort of just more like a kind of byproduct. So I think it's really important um, it, what, what all of you guys are, are, are doing. Um, we're sort of running out of time, so we've probably just got time for, for, for one, one quick question before we throw it out to the audience. But what's the, if you could change sort of one thing right now and hope to get out of this conversation, what, what would it be? Yeah, yeah, I could start. Um, I, one thing, okay, let me constrain Just myself. <laughs> uh, we need to think about. We need to think about in thinking about the problems that we have. Uh, we need to think about creating ecosystems for subsets of creating that 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 I infrastructure that must exist for us to um, have the scale and the sustainability we need for success. Um, so ecosystems for. Um, design development, uh, production, branding, marketing, and positioning globally. This, uh, I, I'm going to sneak in one more. We all need to be thinking about global beyond our immediate markets. What we're doing in Africa is good enough for us within Africa, and it's good enough for the rest of the world. So that while the market is still trying to organize itself, while there's still issues, etc., we're thinking about how we project what we're doing and export what we're doing into the global platform. Very well said. David? The first thing that I would do um, is to try to stamp out corruption. And I think that it is scandalous, not just that money is stolen in Africa, but that there are tax havens, shell companies, trusts, lawyers, governments, who allow that stolen money to be laundered through New York, London, and Miami, or other other centers which are known for accepting and turning a blind eye to laundered money. And I think that corruption is a scourge. I think we probably all agree um, with that, but it is going to erode the basis of democracy if something is not done about it. The other thing that I would do is to, and I'm lucky because I, I, I now run the most woman-centric business I've, I've ever seen in my life. Um, I would empower women more and more and more. They are the backbone of Africa. And the treatment of women, I was with Gabriella in the Congo last week, um, in Eastern Congo, and the abuse of women in that region in particular, where they are brutalized for the, for the, for the ends of the, of the militia, that needs to stop. Jacqueline? Wow, how to follow that? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Those are really, really serious matters. Um, I guess from my point of view, and it's a big one to put out here, is about value addition. We're talking about the, the business of African fashion. That's where there's a huge lack. I was in Burkina Faso end of last year at a cotton conference, and I went to visit. They're setting up, the government is working with a team to set up a um, a, a ginnery 
to be able to process the cotton and then you know the production and so forth as well into manufacturing and this there just needs to be more of that um, investment into the the supply chains so that from the raw materials don't have to all be exported yes that is part of capitalism we know that that it happens but we need to keep more raw materials processed into finished goods on the continent to keep value and money and finance and everything in on the continent because that was part of the solution. Thank you, and, and yeah. Rani? Thank you. I mean, for me, I think that the real development of the fashion sector is important. I think that we need to understand the importance of starting from ground up, which is have schools, have right apprenticeships, have business um, 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 mentorships, have you know, important ways of teaching these kids how to brand and mentor. I think that we do not understand how young we really are in the business of fashion. And until we understand that, we are not looking at the right problems. Because you have people, a lot of them might be self-taught, some of them might have come from different schools all over the world, but we don't have great schools in Africa for fashion. And if we don't start from the schools, we're not going to be able to maneuver what it takes to get to the rest of the world. Thank you. I think that was a great way to bring the conversation to a close from here. But um, we have some time to throw out for, for questions in the audience. I think there's some microphones hanging about. There's a gentleman right there. Um, first of all, I'm just hugely impressed uh, by what I've heard today because I knew there was something going on with African fashion. I didn't know quite what. Two questions, two issues arise. The first thing about the ecosystem is that it seems to me people in Africa tend to want to replicate what they've seen in other ecosystems slavishly. Our continent is different, our circumstances are different, we need a fresh look. Second thing is, do you know, I'd heard about Adara, everybody knows about Flisco, but where is your connection with the media that makes Adara a household conversation? Because I'm actually a broadcast journalist myself, and I'm staggered, I don't know what you're telling us today. Thank you. Um, who would like to take that one? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah I, I agree totally. Um, and being right in the middle of business in Nigeria, I understand that our growth and our development has been determined by the market. Um, we're specifically based in Lagos, and by we, we are completely dictate, what our growth has been dictated by what the customer wants and what we see in our environment. What we stock, how we stock it, how we engage with the client, what that client is like, what they're looking for. That, that's what, what our whole concept is based on. It is very specific and it helps you get to the market a lot quicker and it helps you able to influence the other players in the market to see what is actually needed to make this happen. So for sure, for us, we have needed the market and we have grown, the market has directed our growth. Whatever we have done, how we have adapted, how we have changed, how we have managed our, our success is based on what the customer and what the environment demands. Um, David, did you want to I think that's, that? a, may I just say, I think it's a really good point that you make there about not following everybody else's system. The, the, if I look at it historically, the difference that I see in Africa now um, in comparison, I, I mentioned Singapore and Japan and, and, and China, um, at the same stage of development of the textile industry and the clothing industry, I think the creativity in Africa is way ahead now at the beginning than it was in those other countries. I mean, it, it followed in those other countries, but I think that in Africa you have it right from the start. And in terms of media, yeah, good point. We don't, we don't use the media very much. Okay. But is that, is well, so there's one right there. So, because <laughs> um, I suppose the other question is like, you know, are, are, are you, aside from going out and obviously having to sort of try and make the connections with the media, um, 
as businesses of varying size. Are you, are you seeing any sort of natural interest coming your way, whether it's via social media or you know, conferences like this, um, you know, bits, bits of press that you've, for instance, that you've done at a conference like this? Do you, do you start to see some, some momentum and some growth of interest? I mean, yes, but I, I want to say something that's very important to me. At this stage, the, mo the least important to me thing to me is media around what I'm doing. There's too much plumbing to do. There's too much groundwork to do to build something that actually is pretty significant. That's where I'm going with this. So, and I'm, if I were to, if someone said to gave me a media get opportunity gift today, I'd give it to my women. Let's expose them, let's teach them how to use media properly. But Adara right now doesn't really need it. What we need is much more str strategic collaborations um, that will help us provide things that provide industry-wide, um, socially relevant, economically relevant solutions for my continent. That's, those are my priorities, that's what I want to engage in. And just to the question about are we getting interest? Yes, we are. Truth is, I don't really know what to do with it at this point. So I, I'm thankful for it, and we're, we're, we, we're trying to leverage it where we can. But I have, mo I have more important asks for the people who have any interest or, or remote understanding about what we're doing. And it's not about being out there. Sometimes you need it. You need it to connect to people like you. And those connections help. It could be different types of people like that in Africa, and it helps you. To, it helps your journey. Um, because I think that I, I'm very much b a great believer in connectivity and exposing what you're doing so that you can get help and you can, you can get assistance and you can get, when people see you, they, c they know what you do and they're able to actually buy what you have eventually. Uh, and so sometimes you're busy working really hard with what you're doing, but he's right, it's super important to be connected. Yeah, and, and also it's, Oh, what I found is because I've been doing this business for 10 years and over those years, I mean, we all know the media as well can be very, uh, what nice words can I use? But they're not, can not, can not very nice sometimes <laughs> and their focus on Africa has always been the dark continent, has always been the poverty and the negative. They're more interested in those stories. I mean, this is important, but what's happening in the Congo, how they're treating those stories, which are important, I'm not disqualifying them but they'd rather that than talk about any of the, the amazing work that you're doing, for example. You know, I, I've, I've had opportunities to be on platforms like, you know, in BB, BBC, in Vogue, Italia, um, Al Jazeera, talking about things about African fashion industry. And I jump at this, I've chased down Draper's Record, which is one of the number one industry magazines, WWD as well, you know, take those opportunities to speak about the opportunity of Africa's fashion and textile industry as a sourcing platform, as, you know, to be, that it qualifies in the industry of fashion, which is worth $2.4 trillion globally, okay? So I will push that story, I think it's important, and I'm looking, if anyone in press here, let me work with you and speak with you about this story, because this is the way to push this story forward. Yeah, and can I quickly say something? Sure. Um, no, uh, also for us, we have been very lucky. Um, a lot of people have sort of engaged with our vision and supported it. And it has, we've never paid for PR, but we've got a lot of attention simply by people wanting to know more about what we're able to do. And a lot of Africans feeling very connected and empowered by our vision. And I think that has propelled what we do from an idea to something that could be really, really big. And I think uh, you're seeing Alara as a rallying point for, for Africans um, and Africans empowerment has helped and literally Africans all over the world reach out to us all the time to ask what they can do to support us, what they can do to be involved. And that is really, really humbling. And it shows that um, it, it, people want, want us to succeed with what we're doing. Thank you. I think we've got, um, got another a question over here. I don't know where the microphones are. It's right here. Lady in a blue shirt. Oh, you've already got one. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Thank you. we'll go to you first. Well, Thank you. Um, um, firstly, it's, my it's oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. Yeah? You go first. It's been inspiring to hear from these illustrious panelists today. And I, 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 so I should introduce um, my perspective on 
the context for my question. So I um, am incredibly proud to have heard from Adara Foundation because I run a tiny incubatory a jewelry brand which is ethical because we manufacture with a social cooperative of women who survived the genocide in Rwanda. Believing in sustainability, I really feel it is important when we talk about corruption to also acknowledge industrial despoliation and pollution which has been facilitated and mostly generated by multinationals. So it, there's an internal discussion around corruption, but there's also an external and possibly following colonial roots discussion about how the world has used Africa as a, a, a means of enrichment and a dumping ground. And obviously within climate change and climate injustice, that continues. My question around luxury though, so that was a comment, forgive me, but my question around luxury is a really simple one. Do we believe that luxury has a place in terms of the psychology of wanting to be part of a change-making process around infrastructure because luxury and fashion is perceived to be frippery by people who aren't in the industry? But Rene, I think you might answer this most expertly. To what extent does the psychology of Lagosians change when they walk past Alara, even if they are not customers, do they have a sense of pride in African luxury that is a top-down flow into we want to make everything better in terms of our perception of beauty and what we are capable of creating? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> it's super important and it's the reason why we're doing this. And I have been amazed at what has happened with Alara. When I opened Alara, I felt, oh my God. I stood in front of my shop and I said, nobody's gonna come. Nobody's gonna come because they're not gonna understand what I'm trying to do here. We have worked for the last four years to get people to understand the importance of what we stand for, which is that, yes, we are Africans. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have poor people. But yes, we can also enjoy beautiful things and have people benefit from what they produce. And we have had such great attention from that. And people stop and wanna be part of it. They wanna be part of it and they wanna know what they can do. When I say we have had support, patronage has been the number one support. They come in and they say, what can we buy? And they come in, yes, they come in to buy the Saint Laurent's of the world, but they wanna make a difference. They really want the African brands to succeed and they want to be part of those people that see them grow. So in the end, in the end, we can talk about many, many problems, but there's an organic way that we can grow and grow and remove poverty from our environments. It can be organic. It doesn't have to be like this structured whole idea. What you want is support and patronage. What you want is people to understand why they're buying products and understand that it's enriching them but also it's going to make the lives of the maker better. And I don't think there's anything we do in Alara that has as much impact. So yes, to your question. Um, I think we are almost out of time, but I'm just gonna throw to this lovely lady here. Um, Thank you for your well, patience. Um, my name is Avis Charles and um, I own my own company. And one of the things, well, the first thing I wanted to address was that in regards to corruption and the way women are treated, this is actually a global thing. This isn't just something that is happening on the African continent. In regards to um, teaching and in regards to schooling um, from a fashion point of view, one thing that our company did a few years ago was that we brought together um, via the International Trade Center a group of artisans from Peru, Papua New Guinea, um, Palestine, India, Ethiopia, and Mongolia. I've also worked in other, country, uh, other countries as well. We then put together um, three income streams for those women. These are women that basically worked in rural areas. We worked with um, London College of Fashion as well as Parsons New School of Design. If I jump forward, we ended up doing a lot of the training with the women coming to both countries. But what the end result was is that all of those women are still working now and their businesses have developed. Between the 13 women they have employed over 1,365 women in all of their countries. We took the ladies from Mongolia to Ethiopia because Ethiopia and Mongolia both spin. 
So together, the women all created new fabrics. So you have two totally different cultures. We taught them everything that you would possibly need from mood boards right the way through to selling. We even had um, an agent within New York that actually set up a space for them as well. I think what I'm saying here is that is to reach the women where they are. It is not always necessary for them to have, have been educated through a university. I think it's a respect of what they actually bring to the table. And for us that are in the industry, and I've been in it, for anybody that was here yesterday, over 48 years, is that basically it is up to us to reach the women way, where they are and grow from there. Thank you. Aha, perfect. <laughs> Do we have a microphone? I popped out to move my car. If anybody's asked this question already, just shut me up. <laughs> but my, I'm really, my dying question is, is, when will the, the business of fashion achieve scale on the continent? And I say that because I live here, and every time I go to Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, I love shopping for fashion, but it's a cottage industry. You go to fashion designers' homes, and you know, you're, you're buying items of you know, different people who don't have any sort of skill, mm -hmm. Who, have not, who are not producing in large numbers and who actually cannot enter the global market. And I just feel it's a pity that we're missing something. We're just, the, the, the industry has not, apart from textile industry, I'm talking about actually uh, production of garments, of clothing, of high-end, medium, even mid midstream um, clothes, whether it's an African type fabric or not, there just isn't scale. You can't go into a Zara type store and buy off the peg in Nigeria or in Ghana when actually you have a huge population to clothe who are still buying secondhand and also a huge population who can be employed if that fashion industry could achieve scale. That's my question. This is probably in terms of the infancy of the industry, right? I don't think it will scale until you have a domestic textile industry. Um, I think it's very difficult, my, my understanding anyways, it's very difficult for fashion designers to get good quality fabric locally at, at, at a good price. It's very difficult to get good tailoring as well. Um, and what is needed therefore is education, of course, first and foremost. But after that, it is investment in a domestic textile industry that can support then a fashion industry. I don't see how you can import all of the inputs that you need for your fashion industry when you want scale without having that basis. Value addition, as I keep saying. Um, it's, with certainty, it will take a very long time. Um, if you ask me to put a number, I can't see it really coming to that scale, even with leapfrogging innovation, technology, committed Africans, etc. I can't see it happening before five to seven years, five to 10 years. I say five, just to be conservative in case we're surprised. There's so much infrastructural issues that we have. I thought I could whiz in there, um, mother of execution, set up a production center, and, uh, and it's riddled with issues. But I, but I can tell you this, it's changing every day. There are many more people who are coming into this, becoming more aware, and pulling resources together and, and actually just the sheer understanding of an increasing number of people that this is a necessity. It's not a joke, it's not optional. We can't afford not to develop and expand our fashion industry. We all love fashion. It's still easier and better to, I, I can't find the base fabrics that I need in the continent. Most of them, especially for the more luxury things we do like the silks, I can't find them in continent. So we still have a long, long way to go, but we, for sure, we're going to get there. I, I, do, I do think that it, it can start to grow organically, and it already has. I think the problem you have mentioned is what many people are trying to solve at the moment. You have people who have decided to invest in production units, to invest in training. There are little pockets of it, and there will be pockets for a while. And, and, and I think that's just organic growth, um, and it's expected. So we're going from you know, one tailor and two tailors to 
bigger, and they have started. There are few that already started. There's one in, in, in Apapa in Lagos, there's one in Aba. They're starting, um, and it's just a matter of time. Uh, and, but I think it, the, people are conscious of it, and, and there's a lot of movement of um, people looking for investment in, 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 in production in, in Nigeria in particular. So I think it's growing, um, and people have pockets of it, but I think what you're, you would envisage, what you're envisaging will take a little bit of time. And also, just a quick one, I know that the MC is back, but when, as we are doing this, like the lady over there did raise a point, and it's something that is very close and dear to my heart, is about what we're doing with the waste, what we're doing and thinking about responsibly and sustainably. If you're using digital printing, that's obviously better than, than um, other methods of inks and dyes, especially um, unless they are um, toxic free. So there's things that we need to consider and to do things sustainably in Africa so we don't just replicate the same industry that the rest of the world is and now they're trying to sort things out from this big issue of too much clothing, too much waste, and too much crap basically being flushed out each season. Thank you so much. I know that we could probably sit here and bang on for, for hours because um, we're all passionate about this, but we have run out of time. Um, thank you so much um, for your really amazing and invaluable um, perspective. Uh, and I think like I've, I've sort of been really just thrilled to listen to you talk and I'm sure the audience has as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really